start. All righty, and we are recording. Uh, people are starting to pop in now. So welcome everybody. Just We're just gonna wait a few minutes while uh, the attendees pop in. So have a, have a virtual seat and we will be right with you. Okay. Okay, the names are popping in. Okay. I don't see them really. Yeah, there's an attendees. Uh, oh, participants. So, yeah, under participants, all the attendees oh, so are we, listed. We won't see them in in the little. Um, no. You okay? No, they don't have a window. All right. Um, Robert here is here, so I'm going to promote him to panelists. And here he comes. Okay. Welcome, Robert. Unable to start video. Hmm. Oh, hold on, Robert. I got to just let me enable your, I'll make you a co-host about that. And then you should be able to start your video. Not, not that you can see me. Right. <laughs> there we go. In the mask. Oh. Right. Okay. Hi, Juliana. Hi. How are you? I'm doing all right. A little, a little frazzled with the uh, all the confusion about the email with the Zoom links, but I think yeah. we straightened it out. Oh yeah, no, we're we're fine. So I'm going to get started then, since uh, you know, you know, more people may file in, but uh, I feel like we are good to go. Um, let me just get my notes up here, and uh, yeah, so. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. And welcome to the second uh, installment of the 2022 Sarah Little Turnbull Visiting Designer Lecture Series, where we're, we'll be talking to various luminaries in the world of design, art, philosophy, activism, and today, environmental and geographic information science. Um, we're going to be talking about that. Uh, before we begin, though, I just want to express uh, my deep concern for the people of the Ukraine. Um, it's it's really unthinkable and incredibly wrong what's going on there. Um, so our thoughts are, are with them today as we discuss something very different. Um, but if anything, I think a silver lining from what's happening there um, is the current volatility in the oil and natural gas markets. They've like shot up in, in terms of prices and it provides a, a pretty clear and present reason for why we shouldn't be using those things, I think. So there's one thing we can take away from this. Um, this semester, we're gonna be focusing on the climate crisis and we're gonna be exploring this topic through a number of different uh, facets. And inter interestingly enough, geopolitics is not one of them. But if it were, we'd have plenty to talk about. Uh, this lecture series is a component of an inter interdisciplinary design course on climate design. And it's paired design students with science students, which whom some of whom you can see in, in the back and Robert's screen, uh, to create a more holistic response to climate change. Um, these students are here today with us and they'll be interacting with us in the Q&A section. Uh, with me again today also is Robert Wurzberg. He is a, uh, just for um, just to reiterate, he's the teacher of record for this climate design course that I'm talking about. Uh, lastly, this is open to the public, this, this lecture. So if anybody uh, wants to ask questions, they're free to do so in the Q&A section down at the very bottom of the Zoom screen. And the series is running concurrently with the Echo Urgency Now or Never uh, exhibition in the Lehman College Art Gallery, which is over by April 23rd. So I urge you to go uh, make a, an appointment to go see it. Now to our guest, um, I want to welcome Juliana Monte. She's professor of urban environmental geography at Lehman College and the CUNY Graduate Center since 1998. She founded and directs the graduate program in geographic information science, as well as the urban GISC lab. And she's created and taught courses such as environmental modeling, spatial analysis of urban health, historical and cultural GISC, and GIS research methods. Her main research areas are environmental justice 
health disparities, risk and exposure assessment, and participatory, participatory GISC, specifically in urban areas such as the Bronx, and has edited several compendia and written two widely used tech, textbooks and numerous other publications on the urban environment and geospatial analysis. And for 20 years, 25 years prior to her academic career, she was an architect, which is a designer basically, right? An urban planner and an environmental analyst. Uh, Dr. Monte holds degrees from Cornell, New York University, Hunter College and Rutgers. So she's pretty smart, pretty free and smart. Thank you so much for being here, Professor Monte. It's really, we're, we're actually really excited to talk to you because Last week, we talked with uh, Dr. Mann about the philosophical, moral aspects of, of climate change and our, uh, our responsibility to the climate. But um, it's really time for like some hard science about like what specifically is going on in the Bronx and in our world. So it's great for you to, it's great that you're here. So um, I, I understand you want to present some, some of your research, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Thank you, David, for the introduction. Sure. So I will um, go right into screen sharing. Yeah, I have a presentation prepared, which does explain environmental justice a little bit and what 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 it means, uh, why it's important, and also uh, some uh, case studies that I worked on, um, mainly in the Bronx, but other parts of New York City as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you? Yes, I could see a big, beautiful map of the Bronx. Yes. Okay. Now I'm which we're very interested in talking about, actually. Bring this down here. Uh, okay. So I will be talking about environmental justice and how that ties in with health equity and climate change in, mm -hmm. in New York City primarily. Now, there we go. So this is a, a little history background. Um, this, this is a cover of a report, a very, very uh, groundbreaking report that was produced about 35 years ago, it was 1987 from the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice. They weren't the first people to think about environmental justice, but this really was in a way the touchstone to um, pretty much everything that uh, has transpired since. And it was a national report on the racial and socioeconomic characteristics of communities with hazardous waste sites. And one of the, um, takeaways, one of the findings was that three out of every five Black and Hispanic Americans live in communities with uncontrolled toxic waste sites, which was pretty shocking. It wasn't the only shocking thing they discovered. And they did a follow-up report 20 years later in 2007. And unfortunately, at that point, uh, things really hadn't um, changed uh, or, or they hadn't improved all that much. So what is environmental justice or environmental injustice and how can we identify it? How can we fix it? So that's mainly what I would like to, uh, uh, to talk to you about today. So it is about the disproportionate burdens and benefits of the environment, the environment that we create through our industrialization and our consumerism. So at, at a minimum, EJ involves the right for all people to live in a healthy environment, free from hazardous conditions, and with the goal that no specific population should bear a disproportionate burden of the waste products of modern life and industry. So we acknowledge that there are burdens, uh, but it shouldn't be borne mainly by um, some certain subpopulations. So originally the, the definition was um, really focusing on disproportionate burdens borne by the poor and communities of color, 
but it's since expanded, we realized that there are other people that are um, mainly impacted by this as well, uh, such as the very young, the elderly, the infirm, the disabled, immune compromised, pregnant women, immigrants, and importantly, future generations. So uh, of course it affects people now, but we also have to be concerned what we're doing is uh, affecting far into the future. Now the connection between environmental justice and health inequities and climate change is actually pretty straightforward. So if, if we're exposed to environmental pollution and contaminants and all other kinds of environmental burdens, and we don't have access to health promoting things like healthy food choices and parks, um, we, we are definitely gonna see ramifications on people's health. And the environmental conditions that sort of set the stage for environmental injustice are often caused or exacerbated by the impacts of climate change. And we'll go through some examples of these. So I like this little cartoon because it, it shows here the affluent people in their little bubble of healthy air and sunshine and trees and flowers. They're reading the New York Times in comfort. And everybody else is kind of on the outside in a pile of garbage with a lot of, uh, you know, pollutants coming out of the smokestacks. And this is really not just in this country, this is the way the whole world is. And there, there are very few people that are really uh, benefiting from this. And it's not only the fact that we have so much contamination and pollution disproportionately affecting populations, but also that um, our, our regulations and our policies that have been developed to sort of mitigate uh, the, the, the pollution have not been applied fairly everywhere. So some people are more protected than others. First of all, they have less exposure to pollutants, but where there is pollutants, they have um, the laws are better enforced and they're protected. And I think we have to think about environmental justice as not just an environmental issue, but it's also about economic equality, healthcare, shelter, human rights, preservation of other species, and, and even democracy. So it, it, it becomes a more of an all-encompassing um, approach to, you know, how, how are we going to live on this planet? So it, at Lehman College, in our Department of Earth, Environmental, and Geospatial Sciences, uh, we have the Urban GIS Lab, which does research on these very topics. So we talk about um, environmental health justice, health disparities, the impacts of land use and zoning decisions, uh, urban policy and regulatory issues, and how the neighborhood effects of the built social and natural environments can influence health outcomes. And we tend to look at the sort of the micro environment rather than looking globally or even nationally. We're looking at smaller areas where we can really get some more nuanced uh, data and really uh, delve into it in much more um, detail. So in our research work, and we've, you know, the Urban GIS Lab has been around now for about 20 years. Uh, we have done many studies on a variety of different instances of environmental injustice. And we have found not only significant relationships between health outcomes and environmental factors, but also the fact that there are definitely disproportionate impacts of these relationships on poor people and communities of color. So I'm going to go through some of these projects um, as quickly as I can. If we run out of time, we'll, we'll have to just talk faster, I guess. 
Um, but I urge you and encourage you to look at the website that's listed here, which will give full details of these studies, these that I'm going to talk about now, as well as many, many others. If, if you're interested, you can, you can check it out. So a little background on the Bronx itself. So we have um, this map showing population density. And I'm just trying to get this thing off of here so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, let me get this off. Hmm. Yeah, there we go. No, that's not it. There we go. Okay, I couldn't even see my whole screen. Sorry about that. So we have um, one dot represents 200 people. The yellow are Hispanic or Latino people. The blue dots are non-Hispanic black people. And the red dots are non-Hispanic white. So even without knowing anything else about the Bronx, just looking at this quickly, you can see the Bronx is actually still a very segregated environment in terms of population, you know, subpopulations, uh, racial and ethnic. Uh, you also see that in the parts of the Bronx where the dots are closest together, that indicates the density of population is, is highest. And that tends to be the Latino, uh, predominantly Latino areas. Oh, my. Now this isn't advancing. There we go. Little bit about the economics. The Bronx has the lowest per capita and household income in New York City, which is in contrast to Manhattan, which has the highest per capita income in the whole state uh, by county, right? So there's 62 counties in New York State. The Bronx County ranks last of these 62 counties uh, in three metrics, per capita income, median household income and median family income. The Bronx is the poorest urban county in the nation. Parts of the Bronx are within the poorest congressional district in the nation. And the Bronx, not coincidentally, also suffers from severe health inequities and disproportionate environmental burdens. Now, this is a map of the mean household income by census tract. And the lighter the area, the less income per household. So again, just doing a sort of a visual look, a spatial correspondence, you can see the poorest areas tend to be where the um, Latino population was co um, concentrated. OK, so with that background in mind, uh, we're going to go to the study on air pollution and asthma hospitalizations in the Bronx. Now, the study was done a while ago, so these actual rates uh, may have changed. Hopefully, they've changed for the better, but I think the general trend is still the same. So the top graph is showing uh, asthma hospitalization rates for children age 0 to 14 by borough. The bottom one is asthma death rates for all ages by borough. And you can see the Bronx uh, leads the way pretty dramatically of, of all the other boroughs. And these two, um, these two metrics are actually the most serious outcomes of asthma, right? Hospitalization and death, it's pretty serious. Uh, it does not cover actual asthma incidence, which we do not have good data on because it's not uh, something that's tracked in a central uh, database. So what we do have is hospitalization and death, which are the most serious outcomes. So we were interested in how does air pollution factor into who gets hospitalized um, from asthma? And we decided to look at uh, you know, there's, there's many reasons people posit for the high incidence of asthma, but outdoor air pollution is probably uh, one of the more significant ones. And we looked at toxic release inventory facilities, which are represented by the pink 
triangles and stationary point sources, which are like uh, smokestacks. Um, and they are uh, the gold circles. The larger the circle, the more the pollutants that are emitted. And the underlying chloropleth map is showing percent minority per block group. That's a census um, block group. So you can see again, the uh, locations of these stationary point sources and toxic release facilities are pretty much concentrated in the high uh, minority areas. And what we found when we did this uh, study looking at where the asthma hospitalization cases were and the location of these um, pollutants, you are up to 60% more likely to end up in the hospital with asthma if you live in close proximity to one of these um, sources. We also looked at what's called mobile sources, which is basically cars and trucks and so forth. So we had the, um, the toxic release facilities, the stationary point sources, major truck routes, and limited access highways. When you combine all those impact buffers together, the Bronx is pretty well covered with impact buffers. So um, it's amazing that everybody doesn't have asthma. We zeroed in on a few parts of the Bronx. This is the Hunts Point area. This is in particular public school 48 in, in Hunts Point. And at the time we did this study, the students at PS 48 had the highest hospitalization rate for asthma in all of New York City. And uh, the green again is the um, little triangles are the TRI facilities and the other pink dots are some other schools, which are also impacted by this. And this is a photo of the NIAFCO plant, the New York Organic Fertilizer Company sludge pelletization plant. It's since been closed, but it operated for many years. And it's where uh, New York City shipped its sewage sludge uh, from the wastewater treatment plants which was heated at very high temperatures and turned into pellets that we used for fertilizer. And it was uh, quite a bad thing to have in your neighborhood if you live near there, uh, not only for asthma, but other respiratory ailments. People got nosebleeds, they were nauseous, they had headaches, their eyes were watering. So it was um, uh, a good thing that now it, it finally closed down, but it took years. So this is the uh, yellow dots are the asthma hospitalization cases, one dot equals three cases. And again, just visually looking at it, you can see that it, uh, the density of the dots matches up pretty well with the high, the, the darkest areas underneath that are the high levels of federal uh, p uh, households under the federal poverty level. Um, the, the darkest black is if the uh, census tract is 47 to 100%, everybody, in, in other words, below the poverty level. So it's linked to race, ethnicity, as well as economic status. And this is just another part of the study that we did. This is instead of looking at uh, toxic release, uh, we were looking at other criteria pollutants, um, carbon monoxide being one of them. And we got this data from the National Emissions Inventory uh, Database. And we had good data for all of these stacks. And then we sort of interpolated it out to cover the whole Bronx. So switching gears a little bit, we're gonna talk about a regulatory thing now instead of the actual pollution. So uh, expulsive zoning, this is all about manufacturing areas. And nowadays when we talk about manufacturing in New York City, we're typically not so much talking about factories, but just noxious activities uh, that are ma mainly waste related, things that have to do with uh, garbage and wastewater and th things of that nature. 
So if you look at these areas that are kind of outlined in blue, these are the major um, menu, areas that are zoned for manufacturing. In other words, as of right, you can locate a noxious industry there within, you know, within reason. And again, you can see that it matches up pretty well with the areas, the dark orange areas that are the areas of higher concentration of minority population. The pinker the area, the more um, non-Hispanic white people live there. So again, we have a situation where for many reasons, it's, it's complicated to get into it, but for many reasons, these manufacturing zones are basically where poor people live and people of color. And uh, th there's a whole historical context to it. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about, well, was it done on purpose? Was there intention to it? And, and you know, we can argue about that back and forth. In a way, it almost doesn't matter because this is, this is the effect of it. We have it now. And now we have to figure out how to, how to deal with it, how to change it. So we did some case studies. This one is Bathgate in the Bronx. And we looked over time from 1960s to 2000. And we looked at where zoning was changed because zoning is not immutable. It can be changed through uh, various legal mechanisms. So in the beginning, it was a more residential neighborhood. And as the years go by and the area got more minority and less white, uh, all of a sudden, uh, some of these existing manufacturing zones or even zones that weren't manufacturing got to be bigger and accepting of more intense noxious use. And at the same time, in that same 40 year period, in places like lower west side of Manhattan, uh, the, the manufacturing zones were either eliminated or change to residential or mixed use commercial. And um, basically, uh, you know, this was mainly due to the city's desire to gentrify and regenerate certain parts of the city. Um, unfortunately, the Bronx was the recipient of the zoning changes that resulted in increased M zones. At the same time, M zones were being decreased in, in other places. And it's just another view of this um, percent minority population and all the, uh, uh, all the toxic um, release facilities. You know, this one, flooding risk and vulnerability assessment this has a lot to do with what we're experiencing now in New York and, and elsewhere uh, with increased storms and hurricanes, um, probable sea level rise, storm surge, and so forth. And we're, you know, sort of on the front lines of this. We have 600 miles of coastline in New York City. More than 15% of our land is within the FEMA 100-year floodplain. And we have frequent storms that are increasing because of climate change, uh, sea level rise, it says here future, but it's happening already. Uh, and most of the city is only at sea level or slightly above. So we're particularly vulnerable. And a large proportion of our population lives within the flood zone. So it's a risk to critical infrastructure such as underground utilities, our subways, hospitals, and so forth. And we're a city of islands, so it's hard to evacuate. Um, the Bronx is actually the only part of the city that's on the mainland of the US. So the map here shows the purple, the lavender areas are the FEMA 500 year flood zone. And the yellow and uh, red are estimates of the future um, flood zone based on projections of sea level rise. So it's, a, it's a, you know, a good, a good portion of the city. And this is looking at um, Coney Island in Brooklyn. 
and the the blue is the the floodplain. So this is what would be inundated if the projections are correct about the uh, sea level rise and so forth. And it's good to remember that it's not only people and their property, their homes that would be inundated and destroyed, but also other things that are far more dangerous like um, wastewater treatment plants, Superfund sites, TRI sites, brownfields, all these things, if they were flooded, would release a tremendous amount of contamination into the surrounding rivers and harbors of New York and take it you know, pretty well far and wide. So it would be a, a, a pretty big catastrophe uh, with uh, the spreading of the contaminants. So again, we want to see who is vulnerable, who's really at risk. So we mapped out the different uh, major subpopulations, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, and Hispanic. And then we compared three different ways of making these estimates. And this is a sort of a hypothetical floodplain here. This is the method, the centroid method is what the Federal Emergency Management Agency uses, FEMA. Uh, they use this method for the whole United States. So it's not particularly geared to New York City. And when you use their method, this particular little area here would come up with zero people at risk. It's just kind of a fast and dirty um, method, which is good when you're dealing with the whole country. But when you're dealing with individual cities like New York, you have to be a little bit more exact. So this is another common method, aerial weighting. And using this method, we would get 872 people at risk, which is obviously better, more accurate. And then we developed a method called SEDS, the Cadastral Based Expert Dasymetric System, which people who uh, took my class in environmental modeling probably remember with great fondness. Uh, and this is based on estimating people on the basis of uh, property lots. So you get a lot more accurate, a lot more nuanced. And this way, 11, more than 1,100 people are determined to be at risk. So it's, it's a much more uh, robust way of estimation. And this matters because if we're talking about who is impacted, uh, we wanna know who they are, where they are, and things like that. So with the SEDS method, for all of New York City, we estimate 400,000 people would be at risk, uh, whereas the other two methods, many fewer people. And this, is, this follows through for all of the major subpopulations, uh, but with the caveat that non-Hispanic Black people and Hispanic people are underestimated at a higher rate than everybody else. So they're, they're they're in the floodplain, but the typical ways of estimating their populations are, um, are way off. So this is a little case study we looked at to develop our vulnerability index. This is Brighton Beach in Brooklyn. And we looked at things like uh, who's going to be most vulnerable. So it's going to be the young, the old, the disabled, people that don't speak English well, people with uh, no high school diploma, people below poverty, and then the major um, uh, racial and ethnic groups that would be vulnerable. And we developed this thing called the uh, NICHV, New York City Hazard Vulnerability Index, which is uh, based roughly on a similar index that the CDC developed but again, that was for the whole country. We wanted to make it very New York City based. And we um, used uh, a little bit different um, variables than they had. And the way it looks uh, when we mapped it out is that the darker brown areas are the more vulnerable, but all of Brighton Beach uh, would be in the, the high, higher vulnerability um, uh, regardless of the color brown. We also mapped the critical infrastructure like the subways, the hospitals, the fire precincts and, and schools and so forth. 
And the last one, I don't know how we're doing for time, but let me let me speed it up a little bit. Yeah, it's um, fine. Food justice, which is um, as opposed to things that are harmful uh, and exposure to things that are harmful, we want to talk a little bit about things that you need to have in order to have a healthy life, um, but maybe you don't have good access to it. So we did this study as part of a USDA urban agriculture project. And we first looked at community gardens uh, because in the Bronx especially, there's a lot of community gardens and people use them to grow food, not so much the you know pretty flowers and trees and stuff, but they actually grow food that they eat. They often even have a surplus that they distribute to other people in the community. So we first mapped out all of the community gardens in the Bronx, and then we looked at who, who lives near them, who has the advantage. And it wasn't a surprise that we found that the the people that are poor and people that are Hispanic and to some extent non-Hispanic Black are the ones that live closest to these. And that has to do with the fact that community gardens came into being because they were basically abandoned properties like landlords abandoned their, their buildings. Uh, the city took them over because it was like they were foreclosed because of um, failure to pay taxes. So these, these, are, these are how community gardens got developed um, back in the day. And you know, of course, they're a, a good thing in general for the, for the people that live nearby. Uh, they become a focal point for the neighborhood and people can grow healthy food. They can have educational programs for young people, uh, cultural events and things of that nature. So. Um, there's, I think, about 200 community gardens in the Bronx. And they also serve as a means of political and social empowerment, promote a sense of place. Uh, they're a focus for communities that may have little access to safe parks close by. The second phase of it was looking at food desert vulnerability. So where are their uh, areas where people really don't have ready access to healthy food choices, um, you know, like um, full service supermarkets or grocery stores, fruit and veggies. Uh, mainly it would be convenience stores, fast foods, bodegas, things where you're not gonna find a selection that's good or uh, fresh produce necessarily. And also uh, things tend to be more expensive. Just a question about this, uh, just that map with the vulnerability index. Yeah. So if I'm reading it correctly, the darker sort of magenta, it means a higher level of vulnerability. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's interesting and to me, like, it, it's interesting that like Riverdale, the Riverdale area looks somewhat on the vulnerable side. And, right, and that, yeah. that's, that's an interesting point. And that is how, um, that is because uh, one of the benchmarks we use to determine vulnerability mm. is uh, walking distance to supermarket. Right. Gotcha. So of course in Riverdale, uh, walking distance is immaterial because pretty much everybody right. would have a car. Yeah. So we, uh, this was an early iteration of this. So that we, we need to figure out a way to take that into account, you know, mm. car ownership. So yeah. that, that is one thing that does tend to skew it a little bit. Yeah, I would imagine if you put like, if you somehow made the formula so that it accounted for that, this map would change yeah. pretty dramatically, oh, especially absolutely. in those, yeah, okay. Ab absolutely. Uh, okay. The problem is data. It's all yeah. data is always the problem. So how do you get your yeah. data on car ownership? And it's not it's not as easy as you would you would think. No, You're I'm absolutely right about that. Yeah. And um, with this one, we we did a little uh, a study here that shows uh, where people live that don't have walking distance, which we define as a quarter of a mile, don't have uh, a supermarket or a good healthy food option within quarter of a mile walking distance, 
And also, and here's where the other map uh, didn't take this into account, and also where the population is more than 30% below the poverty line. So we kind of make the leap of faith uh, assumption that if you're below the poverty line, chances are you may not have a car. Okay, so then that, that sort of leaves Riverdale out of it. Understood. Now, uh, uh, one sidebar for this is that we, we're not only looking at geographic access, but also economic access to healthy food. So this is Hunt's point. This here is the largest um, wholesale food market in the entire Northeast of the US. But these people, this yellow area is where the people live, the residential area. They don't have access to that because it's wholesale. And they have very few real good um, healthy food options. So we did what's called a market basket survey. One of the research assistants went around and looked to see like in a typical shopping list, how accessible was it, how available it was, what the selection was, and importantly, how expensive it was. And of course, no surprise, you know, if you're thinking about milk and fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, uh, a lot of those things were either not available or they were in, you know, they weren't fresh and they were very expensive. So that's kind of another twist on how, how available, how accessible really is it if you can't afford it. And I'll just whiz through this as a very short little uh, project um, I worked on with the EPA a few years ago. And they have, you know, one of their main uh, bailiwicks is enforcing uh, environmental regulations. So they wanted to identify what they were calling environmental justice communities. So they could beef up their regulatory and um, enforcement efforts. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's not only that people in poor communities and communities of color bear the brunt of the contamination, but they also don't have any protection. So EPA was beginning to recognize this and, you know, uh, how, do, how do we figure out where, where these communities are so that we can sort of target them more specifically. And the factors we used to make this index were density of noxious facilities and land uses, ozone concentration, uh, the national air toxic assessments cancer risk, uh, diesel particulate matter, and of course, particulate matter is one of the main uh, triggers for all kinds of respiratory ailments. Um, neurological and respiratory hazard index, PM 2.5 concentration, that's the very, very fine uh, particulate matter. And then the population vulnerability of uh, being below poverty or being in a, a minority population. So we worked on this index and they asked me to use New York as a sort of pilot to see if it works. And when I mapped out the scores, um, most of the Bronx is in the very highest category, which is not good. You don't wanna be in a high category for this. So they, um, uh, they're in the 81 to 100 range of the, uh, of the score. And when we outline all those areas in red, you see that it, it's almost the entire Bronx. It's large parts of Brooklyn and some of Manhattan, not too much in Queens, not too much in Staten Island. So New York City is not uh, doing so well by this metric anyway. All right, so that's it. I wanted to put this up here, the contact information. Uh, that's my email and our um, GIS programs, we have a master's program, and we have two certificate programs, one undergrad and one grad, and majors in environmental science, earth science, and geography. So if anybody's interested in any of those things, uh, feel free to contact me. And we'll, we'll make these links uh, available. Oh, okay, uh, good. Uh, yeah, great. Yeah. Um, I do and I just, I just want to put in one little plug. 
uh, for yeah. a course I'm teaching in the first session of the summer. It's an asynchronous online course, and it's called Exploring the Geography of New York City. And we talk in that course a lot about all these issues, environmental yeah. health, segregation, housing, labor rights, uh, you know, all, all the things that kind of made New York yeah. what it is today. So I, if you're interested in this, you know, uh, send me an email and I can give you more info on the course. That was, uh, that was great. I, a bunch of things are like popping into my head and I'm sure they're popping into Robert's as well because that's how his brain works. But I just wanna, I had one question. I know you're not a lawyer, but I feel like you do sort of talk about policy in some sense uh, in your discussion. It's like woven throughout what you're talking about, right? It's very related. And I'm just wondering, what your thoughts are with the, the there's a bunch of recent legal disputes really high profile ones with massive payouts to the, to the uh, uh to the defendants or the the prosecuted uh the prosecution and the the hurt parties one of them is like the recent decision against Remington Arms it was brought by the Sandy Hook uh families Purdue Pharma uh, was recently has, has settled a case. Johnson and Johnson just like two weeks ago famously settled with a, a, a coalition of Native American groups to like the tune of like five hundred and eighty million dollars because of uh, opioid marketing and whatnot and production. And then also related to racial aspects, the Ahmed Arbery case was the federal case was just decided. I think yesterday or the day before, my days are blending. Um, the, the the hate crime trial was essentially mm -hmm. uh, decided, and the three defendants were found guilty of violating Ahmed Arbery's civil rights, and also the George Floyd case. The civil case just got decided that the three police um, that were sort of watching it happen they violated George Floyd's civil rights, and it's all sort of centering around a few different aspects, but it's about rights violation and un unequal protection, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and if it were to, if we're, these were to ever get to the Supreme Court and they're not going to because they're decided, I feel like the equal protection clause of the 14th amendment would come into play here. Just, just a little background on that. No state, this is the equal protection clause. I'm just reading verbatim. No state shall make it or enforce any law we shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, or deny to any person within its jurisdiction, jurisdiction the equal protection of laws. And I'm almost wondering if there's a way, a legal maneuver that, that can make this, this argument that the way um, these facilities and toxic waste sites which are all you know federally and, and they're they're set up by states and, and federal jurisdiction. If there's a way to argue that they were set up and they're distributed inequitably, and they're violating the rights of some right. over the other, isn't that that is where yeah. that argument could rest? There, there have been some Fourteenth Amendment such okay. uh, uh, things. Now the the problem is <clears throat> this harkens back to something I alluded to earlier: the uh, intent. The right. motivation. So, right. and there's been a lot of back and forth on this. Like, well, did they do it intentionally? Right. Okay. Or was it for legitimate reasons? Like, yeah. the argument, well, and this is actually true, uh, there are only certain areas in the city that allow this kind of facility. And it's not our fault that that happens to be where the Black and the poor people live, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, which is, I think it's a specious argument, but but that yeah. has sort of ruled the day. But but also, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's always like, which came first? Did, right. the, did the things settle there first and then the people moved there because things were, rents were cheaper or whatever? Yeah. Or were the yeah. people there and then they stuck the facility there? It's very, very hard to prove intent. But this was part of what the EPA was trying to do because they recognized not only, as I said, that people were burdened with extra contamination, but um, they weren't doing a good job 
or I should say they weren't doing an equitable job of enforcement. Because, yeah. you know, with, with most things, even like I think police protection, um, people that live in affluent communities are usually better protected. Yeah. Uh, and it's the same with environmental hazards. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the EPA actually has, they seem kind of toothless right now. No. Uh, but but they do have pretty wide discretion. I mean, there is like, they're, they're essentially part of the administration. So anything they do can be done through executive order. And eventually that could be litigated all the way up to the Supreme Court. But I feel like that's really right now anyway, lacking congressional action, that is the, the most viable route for any of this. Yeah, well, you know, President Clinton back in the day, I guess it was 19... 92 or something did yeah. write the executive order on environmental um, yeah. justice that every federal project had to take that into account in their impact analysis that's right yeah um, but you know that was limited because it was just really about federal projects but then yeah. many of the states jumped on and did the same for their for their states so it was pretty good i don't know how and it would be an interesting study. How effective really were those order, those whatever they were policies, I guess. Um, yeah. Who knows? But, but all I know is that uh, when the United Church of Christ put out that report, it's not like people never thought about this before, but that really was kind of the springboard for a lot of the environmental justice movement. There are people still today that don't really believe that it's true. Mm -hmm. You just don't, they don't believe it. You know, no oh, matter yeah. how much it, it evidence is. you show them, um, they'll never they'll never agree that, uh, you know, poor people and, and people of color have uh, borne yeah. the, the brunt. And it's true, it's true globally when we think about it. Um, it within the United States, we have people that suffer more than others from environmental burdens. But as the United States as a whole, we're pretty well off compared to other countries where we are shipping the garbage to and the toxins, you know? So if we look just on a national level, um, we're making the problem, you know, other countries as well. But of course, we're making a big part of the problem. We, we use like 20% of the energy in the world uh, and we're like 5% of the population of the yeah. world. But, yeah. but the other countries in West Africa and the Caribbean yeah. and you know, other, other places that um, they, need, they need that income coming in, they, they take our waste and the waste is being like just dumped yeah. and their people are now suffering. So it's, it depends on what scale you're looking at and what level, you know, so scale is very important uh, to, to think about, but certainly within this country, we know who are the most affected and, you know. Yeah. Robert, you had a question. Yeah, I was, well, I was, I was I'm now a little bit behind on it now, but I was going to mention uh, Governor Murphy's initiatives in the last uh, two years. Uh, he's, he's been a little bit more proactive on addressing this. I mean, he's taken some heat, but he seems to be um, he seems to be making that kind of part of his charter yeah. for the state. Have you, have, are you have you? Yeah, New uh, New Jersey actually is fairly forward thinking on and has been for, for a while on environmental issues, uh, maybe more so than New York. Uh, and and you know the federal government. <laughs> they're never gonna put environmental stuff on the top of their priorities. It's just never gonna happen. They're more worried about so many, they, they have so many other things uh, and yeah. somehow the environment just goes down and down on the list, uh, which is ridiculous really, because it, it's so interconnected with the economy oh. and so many other things, you know? But yeah, I, I think New Jersey is pretty forward thinking. Um, and, and certainly when you have a democratic, uh, Governor, it, it, it tends to, you know, bubble up to the top a little bit more. Yeah, and Robert, you also Cuomo had a question. Never, about, it never bubbled up to the top with Cuomo, unfortunately. But you had a question about map map studies, Robert, and I kind of wanted to ask a question about mapping too. Did, what was your? You, 
Uh, said, are I, there any? I wondered if there was any, if, if there was any studies on sort of the psychogeography of the Bronx, and if, mm. if there were, oh, yeah. what, what were the mat metrics of that? Yeah, let me just see. I'm looking through. I saw that pop up before, and I didn't see the whole question. Yeah, it's are there any map studies done on the psychogeology of the Bronx? If so, what sorts of metrics were applied? Uh, yeah. Well, Robert, I have to say one of the students in your class uh -oh. is our <laughs> resident expert on psychogeography. Are you going to tell um, me who it is? It's Brian. <laughs> it's a secret. Brian, Brian, <laughs> Brian Morgan. And uh, he did... He did a nice study. On there he is. There he is. Brian. Can you can you uh, talk a little bit about psychogeography? Because you, yeah, you tell really. Us. Sure. It's um, I mean it's kind of a broad concept. Um, it's to me it's 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 looking at primarily the built environment, more more of an urban focus. Um, that kind of came out of, um, well, a lot of the, the, the people, and I guess it would be the um, 17th or 18th century in France with the, the literary kind of decadent um, poets, French symbolist poets and stuff who would, who they were, uh, the term I think is linear, which is walking, wandering, um, and reacting to your space. And it's, to me, it's, it's questioning the built environment, the space that we're in, um, the, is it by design? You know, why do we do things? Why do we follow the same path everywhere? Why uh, is there a way out of that? Is there a way to disrupt that? Is there a way to reimagine that? Um, so you can, you know, explore spaces and you know really think about how that affects you or what you're getting out of it. Um, what was intended there? Can, can you look at it differently? Can you imagine a different space? Uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a pretty broad thing, like I said, but it's, it's an interesting, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of it that I have seen that's New York City or Bronx centric. Um, there, there's a loose sort of group of psychogeographers around around the NYC metropolitan area a while back. Um, but it's it's not a strong collective thing that does a lot of a lot of activism or that. Um, having said that, I you know it's always fun to you know explore that further or find people that are interested in something like I, that. I, I think it's really interesting only because to me it kind of sounds a lot like experience design. You know, how do you design an experience? It's, it's all about geography. When it's at large scale, geography is a big part of that, right? And, and a build environment design team is gonna have to think about all of these things. Like, what do things look like? How do they feel to people? What are the concerns of the people living in those areas? You, you kind of get the feeling from the design of the Bronx that you know, such as it is, which I, I understand much of the Bronx was designed after uh, the Champs Elysees in, in Paris, it's sort of, it's like the Grand Concourse is kind of mm -hmm. supposed to mirror that and mm -hmm. which is, a, you know, and, and that part of Paris is like a very, I mean, Paris itself is a very medieval city, much of it, and then it kind of grows out from there. Yeah. Which is to say that it was barely designed at all, right? So that you take a city like that and then you apply it to a place like the Bronx, and then you apply all these other things like these rezoning uh, projects over the course of decades. And it it is almost like the Bronx was, I don't know how to put this, it was designed not with people in mind, but with industry and capital in mind, right? Which is not the same as I would say about Manhattan or any other borough. The Bronx seems very, uh, it seems very specifically done that way. Um, I, um, I, I, I yeah. don't know. I mean, I think the Bronx has certainly become that. It's yeah. become sort of like the catch-all, like if you don't know where to put something, stick it in the Bronx. But I, I don't so. know that it really started that way. I think, you know, it was uh, probably one of the 
last boroughs aside from Staten Island mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. really be developed. And the Grand Concourse, of course, was the um, supposed to be the the posh area. Yeah, and yeah. The, and the buildings along it are still really nice, but uh, you know, back in those days, people had this, you know, sort of walk to work thing. Right. So that that's another reason why it's hard to disentangle settlement patterns from the locus of pollution because it was actually considered a plus if you lived walking distance from your factory that you worked in. And I think that uh, certainly the South Bronx was fairly industrial from an early time. Yeah. You know? um, but, but most of the rest of the Bronx was pretty residential. Yeah, I guess my point is that it's like um, the, the decisions that have been made haven't been done with a design thinking in mind. I guess that's my point. It's been undesigned, non-designed. That's, that's pretty much true for, unfortunately, urban planning in New York City is very reactionary and it's, yeah. um, it goes according to, you know, the city doesn't have the money to do anything really. So they yeah. depend on private people coming in and saying, oh yeah, I'll make a little plaza here if you let me build another 10 stories. Right. Uh, and so it's always this trade-off between something for the public good and something that is not going to be for the public good. Uh, so it's, they're very mercenary. You know, they'll go with whoever's going to give them something. How, how important is mapping? I mean, you showed us a lot of maps today, but how those maps are all gleaned or generated from data, I imagine, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's what you were, you were making that point. Um, why use maps at all? Like, why not just keep the spreadsheets and databases around and, and use those as essentially the currency of well, your discussions with fellow scientists. You, you can't see anything uh, on, a, on a graph the way you can see it on a map. And also when you're talking about doing spatial analysis, um, that's not something you can do except on a map really. Uh, right, okay. You know, uh, be, behind all these maps in the presentation were a lot of working maps that were not pretty, but just, you know, like, okay, we, we have to um, look at what's gonna be uh, walking distance, even, even to think about something simple, like what's walking distance within quarter of a mile? Yeah. Well, you just can't draw a circle because that's not the way people don't walk the way the crow flies. So you actually have to have the street network and figure out uh, which streets people can walk on because not uh, you, you can't walk on the cross Bronx, for instance. Right. So that that would get very complicated. You wouldn't be able to do it unless you're doing it on a map. Yeah, I think maps are the the they're a tool for making things more tangible, right? They take they take abstract concepts right. and they make them understandable and tangible. And I, I think that's why we're sort of gravitating towards them as a class because a lot of this stuff is just data. But if we can find a way to make it an experience, right? Like a physical, tangential, or ta uh, tangible experience, then I think it'll it'll just be more impactful, honestly. Just the way the way the maps were impactful. Your, your maps were impactful. It, it's impactful not only for the people doing the design, uh, but for the viewers. Yeah. Because most people love maps they relate yeah. to them they don't necessarily know how to read them they misinterpret things but um most people really are fascinated by maps yeah and um they persuade if, yes yes yeah. exactly they're very yeah they're, they're yeah. very uh you you really get a, a you know a reaction from from yeah. looking at a map so, yeah yes so yeah if, if you can translate any of your work that you're doing in the class uh, into a map or a series of maps, I think um, yeah. you're ahead of the game because everybody yeah. will, it, it, they're easier to get yeah, you know, you know, than, than a graph or a spreadsheet. Yeah. In Dorothy here in the chat mentions that maps, uh, they never, they're never neutral, which I think is a really, really interesting point. They yeah. have an agenda and it's even, it's interesting sure. to me because the maps we look at even on like Google Maps, for example, is that's the map I look at the most, right? The presentation that I look at, those are kind of lying in a way because they 
are taking a three three dimensional spherical object and making it readable in two dimensional space, which is a lie, right? And if you look at like um, the original Mercator maps, like the different projections that you know, they're all they're you know all they're maps lying. lie. All maps, yeah, all lie, maps are because lying. they're all yeah. presenting a model of reality, but it's not reality. It's all, it's and still an abstract model, yeah. You're, you're leaving things out. The map maker decides, okay, what mm -hmm. can I leave out? What do I need to put in? Um, there's always so many decisions that go into it. And all of those are judgment calls. Yeah. And every map, even Google Maps, uh, leaves a lot out. Oh, yeah. And you know, uh, uh, as anybody that worked with works with them or to try to find something, they they know they're not. Um, and some of it is intentional, and some of it is just what we would call cartographic license, because you can't literally fit everything on a map. Well, there's also this again, this user experience uh, question that maps are to be they are experienced, and and you have to consider the user and what how much information one user can digest at any time. I mean, that's like a basic UX laws. You know, we can only hold like maybe seven items in our head at any one time mm -hmm. to, to give us many different layers, like economic maps, social economic maps, uh, pollution, uh, food uh, equity and food, uh, food access maps. That's, you know, lots of great information that we all need to see. But can't it can't all be in one. one. It can't yeah. see it all at once, right? So no, that's no, another that, challenge we have. That's just a clutter. It doesn't serve any. It's, not, it's uh, clutter, any exactly. Purpose. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a, actually, uh, a person who writes about this, you probably, you guys can probably know about Edward Tufte. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, so he's he's one of the you know he's li literally written the book about how maps and charts lie, but also how to declutter them and make them more readable. Yeah. Um, there's I, also I, a great book, a very little book. If you ever wanted to um, uh, assign it to the class, they could probably read it overnight. It's by Marc Monnier, and it's called um, How to Lie with Maps. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, That's... How to Lie with Maps. A very little book, uh, but it's it's and it's it's not recent. And this. you know, probably a lot of people would say, "Well, we all know this stuff," but at the time it was written, it was very revolutionary. Because, yeah, you know, we, we all know statistics can lie. Oh, yeah. And, you know, because there's uh, there's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's statistics. Right? Statistics, right, yeah. But, but right. with uh, maps, the same thing. And there's um, been so many propaganda maps by different, um, you know, the, the Nazis were famous for their propaganda maps. Yeah. And they were very persuasive, you know. They... Well, there's this there's this other argument too about how we represent the United States on a map. We have, you know, mainland, and then maybe there, like there's Alaska and then Hawaii. We don't include Puerto Rico, where there are American citizens living, right? Yeah. We also don't include the the many many chains of islands, right. Guam, for example, the Solomon Islands, right, where we have mili significant military installations, right? Yeah. Our, our, that's really the, the the extent of our empire is mostly island based. And I was I, this I'm bringing this back around to what you were talking about before was the reason we had all those islands is because of guano, right? Which was like bat droppings uh, that were built up on many of these islands in, in in the Pacific. We needed guano because we needed we needed fertilizer in the 1800s. We were we had a growing population in order to feed them all. We had to fertilize our land and we had no, there was no such thing as synthetic fertilizer then, right? So the only weird place we could get it was off of these islands and that's why we bought them, right? And then later they became military installation. But then we eventually ran out of guano, right? So there, there was like, right around the turn of the century, there's this food crisis brewing, like how are we gonna feed all these people? And at the same time, World War One was gearing up and this is where Fritz Haber came in. Uh, Fritz Haber was a German, uh, chemist and he actually invented the process for creating synthetic fertilizer which you know we use all the time now um incidentally he also invented chlorine chlorine gas which was used it's, it's a you know it's a it's a banned uh chemical weapon now uh but his it's interesting because you know his invention of of synthetic fertilizer which again it's like three quarters of the world's food is grown with it nowadays, but 
it saved a lot of lives, right? And then in in your pres and I, you know, he's held, he's like a, he's a hero in some ways. He's he's also infamous for inventing chemical weapons. But then in your presentation, you actually showed us a pretty a now a now closed a decommissioned fertilizer factory. Yeah. But it's interesting. I kind of almost feel like you, you you're on you know you subversively have created this indictment of our food system. Right, which is yes, it's inequitable. Yes, we export more food than you know we we need. We we create more food than we can eat, and yet people go hungry. Like those are all well known problems, but a lesser known problem is the fact that because of how we grow food, right, we require massive amounts of chemical fertilizer to replenish replenish our soil, yeah. right. So it's it's and that's all due to monocropping. And, and really poor factory farming techniques. So like underneath all of this is this, is this second layer, what, what you were talking about, is the second layer of just really terrible agricultural policy that goes back again to the 1800s. And I was just thinking, I was wondering if you could comment on that at all, if you have any thoughts on that in your work. Yeah, well, I mean, my work is 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 mainly urban, but you're you're right because everything is interconnected. So right. the fact that we don't have big plantations or big, you know, um, agribusiness right here in the city or even right outside of the city for the most part, right? Uh, we're still in that whole web of interconnectedness with you know uh, how we get our food, where it comes from, how processed it is. And I think, you know, more and more people are becoming sort of aware of the fact that, you know, eating local and eating seasonally is, is good. The problem mm -hmm. with that is that it, it does tend to be more expensive. So right. if you can get something um, cheap, chances are it's going to be highly processed and not local, not seasonal. Right. So all of these things factor into it. I mean, the, the interesting thing about what you say about the fertilizer, so that yeah. plant, the, the one that closed down, the Niafco plant, I actually took a tour of that once because the, I was working at Hostos Community College for, for a center called the Center for a Sustainable Urban Environment. And we were a community university partnership so the community wanted us to sort of intercede on their behalf and help them advocate, advocate for all kinds of things, but the closing of the Niafco plant was pretty much uh, paramount on the list. So we went on a tour and I have to say it was the worst thing I've ever smelled in my life. And the interesting thing, and I would tell people this to sort of freak them out a little bit, if you got any grapefruits or oranges from, from Florida, that they were the prime users of those pellets. And it wasn't, mm. it's not really chemical fertilizer, it's, it's, but there's a lot of toxics in it because it's all the waste, it's all the sludge from the wastewater plant. So it's basically a lot of, you know, human crap and a lot of other stuff that goes through the sewage system. And the day that I went to this tour, I went home on the subway as usual. And uh, <laughs> I mean, really and truly half of the subway car moved away from me. And that was just from being in the plant, walking around. I mean, every, my hair, my clothes, everything yeah. stunk. Um, it was it was really awful. And they gave us as a memento a little tiny jar, like a little mustard jar or something full of the pellets. <laughs> wow. <laughs> quite a quite a souvenir. Yeah. So you didn't want to open it ever. But we, yeah, I mean well, the, the whole food thing in New York is interesting. And that's one of my fascinations with the community gardening movement is that these are people that are really trying to make things more sustainable and i mean people obviously enjoy gardening too but mm -hmm. you, know, you, you go to these gardens some of them uh, the people are growing things that they remember from where they grew up that you just can't yeah. get in new york anymore uh one one jamaican lady i i was um, i got friendly with 
she was growing a whole patch of callaloo, which is hard to get at callaloo yeah. in New York City. Um, people say, well, just eat the, uh, what's the other thing they, oh, collard greens. And I was yeah. like, collard greens are nothing like callaloo, nothing. You can't yeah. substitute one for the other. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah so it's, a, people, it's about- People are doing their little, their little things, but you know, it really is gonna take a whole overhaul of, yeah. of the system. Well, this has been fascinating. Uh, we are run, we've sort of run out of time, but Robert, did you have any other uh, questions or? No, I was kind of curious. We didn't touch on vertical farming and, and, and how, you know, where, where that was going and whether that was going to have much of a presence in the Bronx in the future, whether you had anything on that. But, mm. um, well, I'm not so sure about vertical farming. Um, I haven't heard anything about that in relation to the Bronx. I mean, people are trying all kinds of innovative things. There's a lot of, uh, and, and successful things of like, um, you know, rooftop gardening and yeah. 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 Uh, people that produce herbs and things locally, uh, commercially, you know, it's not just for, for, um, home use, but they, they're actually big, uh, you know, commercial producers of this. And I think that we're going to see that more and more. I think more and more people are going to get onto that uh, bandwagon of uh, let's, let's produce some of this stuff right here in the city. Yeah, yeah because it's, it strikes me that the, 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 um, some of those zones that are so toxic now, that, uh, because of Whatever their industrial applications are, if they if they're converted, um, so that they maintain their commercial value to things like vertical farming, that it it's a it seems like an opportunity actually to solve some of the problems. You know, to, to yeah. help with some of the problems. Yeah, you know. definitely. So, I mean, the whole thing about the Hunts Point food market kind of bugs me too because it is the largest food market. It's yeah. in this whole part of the country and um people uh, people that live nearby don't only have access to it but they don't have access to any decent food you know people in Hunts yeah. point are really deprived in, in terms of healthy food options so th this there's, there's got to be ways to tweak things and you know incrementally make them better because we don't have to think about redoing everything all at once because we know that's not going to happen but just little improvements here and there would even make a big difference yeah, yeah. well this has been you given us a lot to think about which i yeah. i suspected um thank you so much for meeting with us today really appreciate it um you're very welcome it was a pleasure to speak yeah. i mean i wish i could have seen the students their little faces but yeah. I, here, uh, everybody come over here everybody can come around we've got self oh, selfie love. time oh They're, look at that jose <laughs> there are actual okay. people there hello see? hello everybody good, good. oh nice to see you all i recognize so many of you see? it's wonderful real people well i hope you're enjoying the class <laughs> it sounds like a fabulous class it's it's very it's very bizarre. We just brought a um, massive seventeen foot canoe into our Ooh. classroom last week that we scavenged Ooh. from Lehman. We've been going around scavenging e waste, all the stuff that's going to get sent to to other countries and be put in landfills. We we snatched it all, well, some of it, and we're we're thinking about how to use it in an installation. So nice it's, it's bizarre but it's amazing so thank, well, thank I, you so I, much for being part of it and helping i want to keep up with what's going on so i may yes. I may tune into other presentations and if it's helpful i can send you a pdf of my slides yeah sure. that, would, that would be great it might yeah. be nicer yeah. for people to look at than have to listen to and all you're the always lab. welcome on friday afternoons at one o'clock I, yes. I would it's love to campus. join you. I would love to join you one of these days. That's uh, that'd be great. Sounds great. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Bye. And, and, and just uh, everybody remember to join us next week. We'll be speaking with the botanists. So still in the science, realm of science, but uh, we're going to be pushing out the territory a little bit. So we'll see everybody next week. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a good Bye -bye. weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.